50 years, there have been scores of live rock music clubs in the L.A. area. Most are long forgotten, and a few are still thriving and going strong. For the most part, I think these venues defined whatever was going on in music at the time, and it seems like each had a style, and in some cases, even a culture all their own. So, like the teenagers we once were looking for that elusive bar who would look past our fake IDs, we're going to visit a few of these legendary sites and see what still might remain. So just for the uh, sheer number of clubs within stumbling distance of each other here on Sunset Boulevard, uh, we're going to start here on the extreme west end of the uh, Sunset Strip. And uh, we're here at the Whiskey and Go-Go, which is kind of the granddaddy of all the clubs. And it's been operating here at Clark Street and Sunset Boulevard for well over 50 years. So let's have a look. The amazing thing about the whiskey is the chance you're seeing a legendary act in their absolute infancy is always high. It's almost a rite of passage to play here. The Doors, Buffalo Springfield, The Birds would be one era. Van Halen, Cheap Trick, Tom Petty, The Ramones would be another, and on and on and on. I saw Edward Van Halen play right there. It always sounds great in here, and I don't see this place fading away anytime soon. So now we head west. This used to be the London Fog. The Doors played here. Another block up and we're at the Roxy, and the Roxy has always seemed to me a little more high-end than the whiskey. Uh, the bar upstairs on the rocks has a weirdly exclusionary edge to it. Lots of celebs hanging out. I think the Roxy was most known for the original Rocky Horror Picture Show residency in the 70s. And this is also where Bruce Springsteen played very early on and Patti Smith and many others. Next door is the Rainbow Bar and Grill. And though not technically a music venue, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a more music orientated club in the world, let alone Los Angeles. I mean, they had a statue of Lemmy from Motorhead in the back. Not exactly the Lincoln Memorial, but I guess it'll do for rock and roll. And I think it would be safe to say that a lot of people have spent a lot of days nursing a lot of hangovers acquired here at the Rainbow. Another half block up is what used to be Gazari's. And Gazari's was a more commercial venue with dancers and wet t-shirt contests and that kind of stuff in the 70s. And a lot of bands on the local scene back then wouldn't play here because of the stigma that went along with being a Gazari's band. But in the later 80s, it became a very in place for the Sunset Strip hair bands to play. So crossing the street and doubling back a couple blocks, we come to the Viper Room. This club has had a really long history. It started in the 40s as the Cotton Club, got rocking in the 60s as Filthy McNasties, and then in the 80s morphed into the Central. In 1993, Johnny Depp bought the building and the Viper Room was born. It was a cool club with great music and it was not uncommon to see Keanu Reeves or Slash or any number of local rockers hanging out and playing. I remember ordering a drink here and it being served to me by the bartender Adam Duritz from County Crows. Now this place does have a dark side. Right here on the pavement is where River Phoenix OD'd after a night of partying here. And this club is also the last place that Michael Hutchins from NXS ever performed. Alas, uh, the Viper Room itself is a dead man walking. This entire block has been bought and is going to be torn down. Uh, yet another faceless high rise, I'm sure, I hope. Anyways, another one bites the dust, the Viper Room. Hey, hey. What? You got something? Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hey, be easy, be easy. So this is the American Hotel and the site of one of the most legendary bars in all LA history. Al's Bar it was right down here underneath the hotel. And uh, this used to be one of the seediest, if not the seediest neighborhood in LA. And the gentrification here is beyond belief right now. It is really hopping with young people. Fear, Los Lobos, X, Saccharin Trust, Virtually every indie band that ever came through town or was in town played here. It, it was, how I would describe it was the LA's version of CBGB's. And uh, the inside was, uh, well, let's say the bathrooms had something to be desired. So they, they closed their doors here in 2001. Uh, perhaps they should have stayed open a while longer because the neighborhood's really hopping now. But, uh, you know, old buildings and hookers, sooner or later they do become respectable. Al's Bar. What? 
So here we are in downtown LA and we are at the all ages punk rock club, The Smell. And uh, The Smell has been around for over 20 years. And uh, I have to say, this is a terrific club. It seems to model itself after the classic punk rock club in LA called The Mask. The Smell is as arty as the name would suggest, but it's one of the only public places left in LA to see really young bands play. And no matter what you may think of an all ages venue, this club is awesome, and it makes me proud as an Angelina to know that places like this still exist. You have the Troubadour, you got the Whiskey and the Roxy, and the fourth face on Mount Rushmore, the smell. So right here on Figueroa Street is the site of this now trendy steampunk bowling alley. At one time, this was Mr. T's Bowl, and it used to be the seediest of bars and was home to one of the cooler indie music scenes in all of LA. It started in the 90s and ran to about 2013 or 14. I remember there being these creepy abandoned bowling lanes backstage, but I don't ever recall it being open for bowling. Uh, a very hipster scene here, lots of bands, loud, very cheap drinks, and many good times. The Rock has moved on, but it's still a cool place, albeit expensive, to roll. Club 88 was a converted strip club and was where your band played when you were doing your very first gig. It had a very brief heyday in the late 70s when the LA punk movement was first taking hold because they allowed the more hardcore bands to play here. Now just a couple more blocks down Pico is where the music machine was located. It was a big room with a high stage and an excellent sound system. In the late 80s, it was booked by a guy named Gaylord who had very eclectic taste. You could see great buildings in the Mutts one night and Guns N' Roses and Tex and the Horseheads the next. So now we come to what was possibly the best rock club on the far west side. This Petco stands on the hallowed ground of what was once one of the most unique and storied venues in LA. Uh, this was Madame Wong's West, and this used to be a sprawling two-story uh, structure with two showrooms. It was a smaller showroom downstairs and a bigger one upstairs. And uh, virtually any ensign band back in the uh, 80s played here. Uh, before its club days, it was a funeral home, and uh, there was an elevator in the back uh, that was big enough to hold bodies and bring them up and down, but it was also big enough to bring your equipment up and down too. So generally speaking, the downstairs area was where the newer bands played and the upstairs in the main showroom was where the bands with a bigger draw would perform. It wasn't uncommon for six or eight shows a night to be played here. One of my favorite scenes here was a band called Trash, uh, which was actually a cover band led by later to be Guns N' Roses guitarist Gilby Clark. Uh, that would have an endless revolving door of musicians sitting in through the night. I think it was a really sad day when Esther Wong closed this down. Uh, it was one of the best uh, music venues on the west side right here. But uh, then again, who doesn't need another Petco, right? All right, onward. <laughs> We're on 2nd Street here in the heart of downtown LA at the Redwood Bar and Grill. Uh, this place has a cool, piratey, retro vibe and is now probably one of the last bastions to see real live original rock music played. Uh, the crowd varies depending on the band, but there's a scene going on down here and a lot of regulars to prove it. So here we are in Silver Lake, standing in front of what used to be Spaceland. Uh, later on, it was called the Satellite when they decided to relocate their stage. Whichever the case, this was the premier venue in Silver Lake for a band to play. And pretty much any indie band from the 90s and 2000s played here. Uh, Foo Fighters did their first gig ever in LA right here. I personally got to see Elliot Smith play here on the eve of his Oscar nomination. Still one of the best shows I've ever seen, just a, a man and his guitar. But basically empty since COVID, uh, I think it's seen its last show. Right here, stay Since 1949, the Palomino was the primary country venue not just for LA, but for the entire West Coast. It was frequented by Nashville stalwarts of the day like Waylon Jennings and Patsy Cline, 
and was basically a weekly gig for the Bakersfield crowd like Buck Owens and Merle Haggard. In the 70s, it became a country rock hangout, Linda Ronstadt, Graham Parsons and the like, and in the mid-80s, the whole West Coast country revival started happening. Names like Dwight Yoakam and Lucinda Williams and Phil and Dave Alvin were regulars. Closed up in 1995, all that's left is this iconic sign, which is on display at the Valley Relics Museum here in the Valley. So I'd like to think that we've saved the best for last, and they'll be coming up in the next episode. And if you like and hit the bell icon down there, you'll be notified when the new ones come out. Thanks again, and see you with part two. So until next time, be kind to one another. Peace out.